Today on America's Test Kitchen, Dan makes Julia the ultimate spiced rub chicken drumsticks on the grill. Adam reveals his top pick for baking peels. And Aaron makes Bridget a classic version of New England baked beans. It's all coming up right here on America's Test Kitchen. Most recipes for grilled chicken focus only on the chicken breast and completely ignore the other parts. In particular, the lowly drumstick. Yet the drumstick has a lot going for it. It's less expensive, it's made of juicy dark meat, and it comes with its own handle. But you can't just grill a drumstick as you would a chicken breast or you'll end up with this. Ooh, flabby, gross skin. The meat's usually pretty tough. And oh, worst part, gets a little bloody right there next to the bone. Ooh, that's kind of gross. So today, Dan is gonna show us how to grill a drumstick the right way. I'm so excited we were doing this. This is like my original chicken cut. Mm -hmm. Like the drumstick, as a kid, you just always wanna eat that. It's always in cartoons and it looks really great. <laughs> but then you go to barbecues now and you always avoid it, right? Cause it's gonna be like that. So we're gonna finally give drumsticks their due. And it's really easy. We're gonna start with five pounds, which is really easy to buy at the supermarket. There's no prep involved. The first step is we're actually going to brine them. Okay, this, even though it's dark meat. Even though it's dark meat, we usually reserve that for white meat. We want this to be the ultimate drumstick recipe. And so what we're actually gonna do is cook them to a slightly higher temperature than we normally would, really break down that tough collagen. So we won't have chewy meat, we'll have nice juicy tender meat. We're gonna start with two quarts of cold water and a half a cup of table salt. Because of that higher temperature, we have a tendency to lose some of that moisture. So we're gonna try and trap more of it with the brine. You're looking to see if all the salt is dissolved. Yes. And that's actually a pretty important step. It is a very important step. So if it's not dissolved, it's not gonna do much work as a brine. I remember the first time I brined, I totally didn't let it dissolve. And when I put it in the zipper lock bag, and then when I was done, it was like sludge, and it wasn't brined at all. It wasn't brined at all. No. It was just sitting in water for a yep. while. Yep. And so when it turns basically clear, when you can see through it again, you know that you've dissolved it all in there. So we're just gonna transfer these over. We're gonna brine these for 30 to 60 minutes. That's pretty fast. It is, and it's the time it takes us to get the rest of the prep done and get the grill going, so it's not a big deal. So this is gonna be in the refrigerator for that time. I'm gonna do it once we finish with our rub. All right. Put this aside here. So we want this to be super approachable and something you'd add to your repertoire, right? So the flavor profile we're going for is classic barbecue. Mm. And we're gonna achieve that by doing a rub. So we're gonna start with three tablespoons of brown sugar. We need sweetness, and the sugar's gonna help brown a little bit on the grill as well. Next up, we have a tablespoon of paprika. Got to have paprika in your barbecue it's rub. Like, it's like a rule. I think it's a law, isn't it? <laughs> so then we've also got a tablespoon of chili powder, two teaspoons of garlic powder. Ooh, hello. That's a lot. The thing is, this is the place to use garlic powder, right? Like, this is the flavor profile that you expect it in. It works here. It's not the garlic you always want to use, but it's perfect for a rub. I also have three quarters of a teaspoon of table salt, three quarters of a teaspoon of ground black pepper, and a quarter teaspoon of cayenne. You're right, those are all pantry friendly ingredients. And it's classic, right? I mean, you can almost taste what this is gonna be like <laughs> before I even put it on the chicken. We're just gonna mix it up here. I like that you're using the whisk to put a dry rub because you're actually just breaking up the sugar so that it mixes nicely with the spices. So Julia, I brine these for the full hour because I really want them to be extra juicy just for you. Oh, thank you. You're welcome. So anyway, I took them out and I'm just gonna pat them dry here. We want a little bit of moisture on the surface so our, our rub sticks to them, but we don't want them to be too wet. So we've got our, our rub here. I'm gonna transfer it to a large plate. It's gonna make it a lot easier to dredge all of them in there. Just kind of spread it out like this. For the dredging process, it's not that difficult, but there no, are- No, it isn't, is it? <laughs> no, it isn't, but there's a couple little tricks. So a lot of times the skin can get peeled back like this and you get a lot of flavor on the meat, which is nice, but it tends to overcook on the grill. So you wanna make sure that skin is all the way down there. And then what I'm gonna do is just kind of roll it around, try and get it on as much of the drumstick as I can. Sometimes it's hard to get the handle while you're doing this, but we'll have a little bit left over that we can go through and just cover those. As much flavor as possible in there. And then I just pat off any excess, which is gonna fall off later on the grill anyway. I'd rather have it here and then get to use it. Mmm, that looks good already. Right? You know, we thought about glazes for these, but when you're eating something out of hand, sticky glazes are coming kind of a mess. The, the rub really is nice for that. Okay, so I'm just gonna finish the rest of these up and we're gonna head out to the grill. Sounds good. We've got our gas grill preheating for about 15 minutes over high heat on all of the burners. Ooh, you can see the heat coming off that guy. <laughs> it's very hot. We're not gonna cook the drumsticks directly over this intense heat. We saw a lot of recipes that did something similar where it's over a medium high heat the whole time. It's an easy formula to remember, just throw them on, but it doesn't produce very good drumsticks. One of the big reasons is we render a lot of fat from the skin and if it's right over the heat, it just flares up. 
also tends to overcook them. So we're gonna use a two heat method here. And the first thing we're gonna do is kill these two burners. So we've got our primary burner on and these are off. We're gonna All do right. nice indirect cooking first. Before I do that, I'm gonna scrape and clean the grill. Okay, and I have a paper towel with just a little bit of vegetable oil here. And I run it right over the grates. You wanna do a really thorough job because skin has a tendency to stick a bit more than other things. So by putting the oil on the hot grill grates, you're actually making more of a nonstick surface. All right, time to put the chicken on. So this is our primary burner, nice and hot. We're gonna go right next to it here. Now you can see I orient them kind of opposite, so they nestle in really nicely. You can fit a lot of chicken on one grill. You can really smell those spices as soon as they hit the grill. So I'm gonna cover this now, and we're gonna go for about 25 minutes before we flip them, cooking them really nice and gently. All right. Okay, so that's been 25 minutes. Ooh. These guys over here haven't been cooking quite as fast as these ones because they're not as close to the heat source. So we're just gonna flip flop. And the way I like to do that is first move them out of the way over here and then slide these over. Ah, very organized. Looks like something you figured out after you did it wrong once or twice. <laughs> yeah. So we're gonna close this and continue to cook until the chicken registers 185 to 190 degrees. And that's well over the safe temperature we need for chicken of 160 to 165. But during that time, at the higher temperature, it makes a really big difference. It breaks down a lot of that collagen into really supple gelatin, so they're nice and juicy and tender. It takes another 25 to 30 minutes. All right, so the total cooking time is a little less than an hour. That's right. It's been another 25 minutes. I'm gonna take a look here. Ooh. Starting to look good. Still, they really do look good. Still not super pretty because we've got one more step to do, but I want to check the temp here. So we're going to go into the thickest part. We're looking for 185 degrees to 190 degrees, and that's perfect right there. On the nose. Ooh, nice and hot. So now I'm going to transfer them to the hot side of the grill, this burn we've had on the whole time, to get really nice crisping and char. Mm. So it's only gonna take about five minutes here to get them nice and crisp all over, and I'll keep rotating as we go. It'll be nice and beautiful on all sides. Okay. Those look amazing. <laughs> all right, let's get them off. You don't wanna mess around while they're on the hot side, do you? They brown really quickly. Oh, definitely, yeah. We rendered all that fat so it crisps up really quickly. You would wanna pay close attention at this point. Yeah, not a time to walk away. No, it looks so good. Ooh, those look delicious. So now we're gonna cover them with foil, bring them inside, let them rest a couple minutes, and then it's time to eat. Sounds good. Can I do the big reveal? Please. All right. Got some gorgeous, oh, hello. gorgeous chicken here. Mm. So you just have to convince people at your barbecue that these aren't the drumsticks <laughs> they're used to, right? Once they get into them, they're, right? they're gone. I'm just gonna serve you up. There's, All right. There's nothing left to say at this point. It's really, <laughs> it's an eating game at this point. And I like that we don't actually have any utensils here because drumsticks, they're straight up finger no, food. They've got handles, right? Ooh. <laughs> mm. That's so good. That's actually tender. Ooh. Like, I like the spice you know? rub. It's it's not spicy. It's just a little hint, a little floral. Mm -hmm. It's like you're not gnawing it off the bone like you normally <laughs> are with, with drumsticks. It's tender. It's really juicy from that brine. And the skin, you can eat it. It's not flabby. It's nice and rendered. Mm. Cooking up to 185, 190, it sounds really high, but it makes it so tender. It's cooked all the way to the bone, none of mm -hmm. that bloody bone stuff, and then the brine really keeps it juicy, too. Yeah, it's very juicy. These are fantastic. Thank you, Dan. You're welcome. To make the ultimate grilled drumsticks, brine them for 30 minutes, then coat with a simple spice rub. Build a two-level fire, start the chicken on the cool side, then move it to the hot side of the grill to finish. And there you have it. From America's Test Kitchen to your kitchen, the ultimate recipe for grilled, spice-rubbed chicken drumsticks. These are darn tootin' good. <laughs> I've never heard you say that before. <laughs>A cool two grand is going to buy you the world's most expensive pizza, and that's complete with Stilton, foie gras, truffles, caviar, and flecks of 24 karat gold. Now, for a lot less, you can buy a baking peel and make your own pizzas at home. So Adam is here to show us which peel is the best. I did not hear the word pepperoni enter into this $2,000 pizza Seriously, equation. Seriously, is it a pizza without pepperoni? I don't know. I don't think so. And I'll take my caviar plain, thank you very True. much. All right, you can do a lot less expensive for pizzas if you make your own, and you're gonna need a baking peel. This one is our previous winner. It was redesigned slightly, which sent us back to the drawing board with this lineup of five different peels. The price range was $9.79 at a low to $57.95 at a high. You can see some of them are made of wood. These guys here, this one is wood composite, that one is metal. 
These two in front of you have these cloth conveyor belts, which are supposed to make it easier to get things off and on. Sure. Speaking of getting things off and on, that's what our testers did with these. <laughs> they had thin crust pizzas with toppings, as well as loaves of rustic Italian bread that they put into the oven. They then rotated them partway through the baking and retrieved them from the oven. And they were looking for the peels to be comfortable, well-controlled, easy to use. They did not find that on all three <laughs> tasks, Bridget, I'm afraid. None of these excelled at everything. These two with the cloth conveyors, once you dusted them with flour, they were practically nonstick. They were great at unloading mm. pizzas and loaves of bread into the oven. Some testers were a little unnerved at first because they were sliding their hands towards the back of the oven to use the conveyor, but they got used to that. It wasn't that big an issue in the end. When they went back into the oven with these two to rotate the loaves of bread and the pizzas, it took a little bit longer because they had to use the conveyor belts than it did with the other peels. Mm. And that meant that the oven door was open and you were losing heat, so that wasn't ideal. Okay. Also, this guy down at the end had a 16 inch wide blade as opposed to about 14 inches wide for the rest of them. And that extra two inches meant that it was a little hard to maneuver it inside most home sure. ovens. So that wasn't ideal. Moving on to the wood one here. If you dust this with flour, it's practically as nonstick as the cloth covered ones. So you just reach into the oven, give it a little jerk, your pizza, your loaf of bread slides off, no problem, easy peasy. Go back in to rotate it a little bit later on. This one is half an inch thick, and that was a little bit too thick for sort of maximum agility in mm -hmm. terms of sliding under something that's partially baked and turning it around or getting it out of the oven. However, these guys were a lot thinner. They're about 0.2 inches. They were easy to get underneath the partially baked goods and rotate them around. However, unless you used a ton of flour, raw dough stuck mercilessly to mm. both of these things. So, you know, really, this depends on what's the most important task to you. And for our testers, they really thought that unloading a pizza into the oven without getting it all oblong and misshapen right. was the most important thing. And this pizza peel, the redesign of our previous winner, was really the one that rocked at that. So that's the one that they gave the nod to. This is the Exo Polymer Sealed Super Peel. It's $54.95. It did a great job at unloading those pizzas and keeping the shape. If you don't want to spend quite as much money, this one is the Pizza Craft Wood Pizza Peel. It's $27.31, about half the price. And you know what? With the aid of tongs to sort of pull things up onto it, to rotate them around and get them out of the oven, it works just fine and you save a whole bunch of money. Well, there you go. Well, if you make a lot of pizzas or artisan bread, you might want to invest in the Exo Polymer Sealed Super Peel. It's $54.95 and it's our winner. Or for our best buy, you can get the Pizza Craft 14-inch Wood Pizza Peel, and that's $27.31. The only thing between my head and 10,000 BTUs of radiant heat is 0.2 millimeters of aluminum foil. The sheet on my right is painted black. The one on my left is shiny. Now let's look at this on a thermal camera. My left side, as you can see, is staying nice and cool because the foil is reflecting the radiant heat away from me. My right side is getting blasted with heat. If this continues much longer, I'm gonna be like a toasted marshmallow. Radiant heat is the waves of pure energy we get from the sun, glowing charcoal briquettes, and the broiler element in your oven. Because radiant heat is infrared light, you can control it with shiny surfaces. So here's how. If you cover food on the grill with a shiny metal bowl, you can reflect the radiant heat from the coals back down on top of it, speeding cooking and browning the top and bottom at the same time. Trying to cook a whole turkey or chicken evenly? Make a foil shield for the breast and reflect radiant heat away from it. Are your cakes browning too fast at the edges? Make a foil collar around the cake pan to reflect radiant heat away. So remember that radiant heat is light and get creative putting shiny surfaces to work in your kitchen. Baked beans go all the way back to the New England Puritans and they'd simmer bean pots all day in the communal ovens. Now even today, recipes calling for 10 hours of cooking or more are pretty darn common. But Erin is here to show us a much better, not to mention faster, version. I am, Bridget. I don't have 10 hours to spend making baked beans, do you? No, not nope. one bit. Okay, well, we're <laughs> gonna do better than that. All right. Let's start with beans. Sounds good. Okay. We are gonna use dried navy beans, and this is a typical bean used in this dish. It's very tender and creamy and dense and mild in flavor. If it ain't broke, don't fix it. Yep, so we're gonna brine our beans. I'm gonna add one and a half tablespoons of salt to two quarts of cold water. 
I'm just gonna whisk that up until the salt dissolves. I'm gonna add one pound of navy beans to our brine. We're gonna let these sit here for eight to 24 hours until we're ready to cook them. All right. Yep, we're brining again. Now, if you just soak the beans in unsalted water, their tough skins will stay tough. And the beans' increased internal pressure from the absorbed water can cause them to burst. And that happens during cooking. But if you soak the beans in salted water overnight, the skins become more elastic. The sodium in the brine replaces the calcium and magnesium, and they become extra stretchy. Now, these beans don't burst when they're cooked. And as a bonus, the salted water also seasons the beans. Okay, Bridget, our beans have brined overnight and I've drained and rinsed them. Okay. Okay, and as you can see, they have plumped up a little bit. Very nice and plump, yes. And this cuts down on the cooking time too. It does, yep. So now I'm just gonna add these to our pot. And now we're gonna build our pot of beans right here, right now. You'll love it, so there's no prior sauteing or anything it's other stuff. It's easy, it's so easy. It's the easiest dish ever. All goes Absolutely. right together in the pot. Yes, so I'm gonna add two teaspoons of dried mustard, half a teaspoon of ground black pepper, these are gonna help to kind of cut through the sweetness of our beans. We're gonna add one bay leaf. And now we're getting to the sweetener. It's not baked beans if it's not sweet. Absolutely. <laughs> so this is molasses. We're using a half a cup. And most recipes out there actually call for twice as much, mm. but we found that that was just far too sweet. So just by reducing it by 50%, that's all the sweetness we needed, and it's gonna make our beans still very robust. Great. And sometimes if you add too much molasses, it can almost be too bitter. Yes. Now we're gonna add two tablespoons of dark brown sugar. Like the molasses, a lot of recipes out there call for far too much brown sugar, up to one cup. Mm -hmm. So we found that just two tablespoons was all that we needed. And it's great that you're adding both of them, so you definitely get the robust flavor, but it's not too heavy with the molasses flavor. Exactly. So the next ingredient we're gonna add is one onion that I halved, and it's gonna add sweetness and also savoriness. Now we're getting to our salty ingredients. I'm gonna add a quarter teaspoon of table salt, we're gonna add one tablespoon of soy sauce. And what we found, soy sauce really gave our beans not just salty, but it also gave us flavor. It's an umami rich ingredient mm -hmm. and it just kind of elevated our beans up just one more notch. Totally, it tricks the tongue into making you think that the food is meatier than it actually exactly. is. Exactly, yep. yep. So it's one tablespoon. And now we're gonna add six ounces of salt pork. Yay meat. Yay meat, exactly, <laughs> your favorite. As you can see, the salt pork that we have is about 50% meat to fat ratio. Mm -hmm. A lot of recipes out there call for bacon, but traditionalists really stick to using salt pork. We didn't want that smoky flavor mm -hmm. from the bacon to actually mask all the other flavors that are right. going on. Yeah, it definitely is not baked beans without salt pork. No, it's not. It. And salt pork can come from a few different areas of the pig. It mm -hmm. can come from the side, it can come from the belly, or it can come from the back, also known as the fat back. Now, did you know, uh, the New England colonists used salt to preserve pork. So the soldiers of the Revolutionary War and the Civil War would actually use it as rations. Very cool. It was about way back there. Way back. Way back. And now I'm just going to add four cups of water. That's not a lot. It's not a lot. And actually, a lot of recipes call for adding a lot more than that. But we found that all we needed to do was add just enough water to cover the beans by about a half an inch. And that's just to make sure that the beans are submerged as they cook. And this is going to yield a nice silky sauce at the end. If we added too much water, the sauce would be a lot thinner. A lot thinner and not as flavorful. Right. So now I'm going to bring this up to a boil. OK, Bridget, our beans have come up to a boil. Now I'm just going to turn that off. I'm going to put a lid on it. No comment. <laughs> <laughs> and now we're going to put them into a 300 degree oven for two hours. I'm going to start halfway through making sure that those beans are still covered with a liquid. Mmm. Can you smell that? Smells them? good. Yeah. Okay, so these have cooked for two hours. I just want to remove the lid and we're going to put them back in the oven for one more hour. That's going to allow the juices to kind of evaporate, get thicker, and it's going to form this nice crust on top. Mm, All right. So good. So savory. So another hour. One more hour. Uncovered. You are an eagle eye. <laughs> okay. There's, oh. that, there's that extra hour. Oh, what a so difference. Good. It looks amazing. This is like the perfect pot of beans. Whoa. See the salt pork right there, nice and brown. And, and under it. you're right, a lot of that liquid has it evaporated has in there. Yep. And there's a little crust on top. Mm. So we are not there yet, Bridget. See all this nice, beautiful brown fond on the sure side do. of the pot? Well, it's not coming off. Well, that is all flavor, and I want that flavor. So I want it I'm, I'm going to get it. <laughs> so I'm going to put the lid back on the pot for five minutes. I'm just going to let that steam, and then I'll show you how we get that fond. Sounds good. OK, Bridget, it has been five minutes. Nice and steamy. Nice and steamy. I'm going to remove our onions. Mm. Look at that. It's just melting. It's falling apart. It sure is. All that flavor has come out. Bay leaf comes out as well. Bay leaf comes out. And now, as I promised, all that fond, I'm going to stir right into the pot. Oh, yeah. As you can see, now it's coming right off. Yeah, the steam really loosened it. Fond is flavor. Mm -hmm. Anytime you see fond, you want to work it into whatever you're eating, if possible. 
Okay, I'm gonna keep working on this bridge. I'm gonna get all that fond into our beans and then I'm gonna let it sit for 10 to 15 minutes until those juices have a chance to cool off a little bit. And as they cool, they're gonna thicken and coat mm. our beans. I'm gonna start once halfway through. Sounds good. All right, the time has come, Bridget. Finally, they've oh, cooled down. But they have cooled down for about 15 minutes and now you can see that that liquid really has thickened up and now it's coating your beans. I mean, we've started off with not a lot of liquid to mm -hmm. begin with, but really taking that lid off and letting it just go for another hour in the oven it's really key. reduced it, yeah. Yes, absolutely. All right. So I'm just gonna taste it for seasoning, make sure we don't need any more salt or pepper. It's good. <laughs> it's good. The joy of beans. The joy of beans. Would you like a piece of salt pork? Silly question, right? <laughs> I would love a piece Silly of salt pork. Silly question. I mean, cutting it into three pieces of salt pork, that means the first mm. three people that get to eat the beans get the salt pork, right? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> oh, these look so, so good. good. Beautiful beans. And one thing I do notice is they're not blown out. They're not. Yeah, no. so brining it really does help to keep the skins intact. Absolutely. All right, I'm gonna tuck into the beans before I get into that salt pork. Sweet, yes. savory. Mm -hmm. You know, that little bit of soy sauce definitely added a meaty flavor. Doesn't taste like soy sauce, though. Nope. And it can get that like little undertone of, of pork. Mm -hmm. It's just melted right into mm. the beans. I'm gonna go for that pork, though. And it's not too sweet, which mm -hmm. is always the biggest problem with baked beans is they can just be too mm -hmm. sweet and cloying. Now, if you wanna serve the pork mm -hmm. to everyone at the table, if you actually have to share, you can take the pork out, take two forks, shred it apart, and then stir it back into the beans. I mean, come on. These are baked beans perfected. Thanks, Erin. Thank you, Bridget. Well, our three, not 10 hour baked beans, starts by brining navy beans. Boil the beans with salt pork, molasses, water, and soy sauce. Cook, covered for two hours, then uncovered for another hour to create a rich browned crust. Stir all that great fond right into the pot, and they're ready to eat. So from our test kitchen to your kitchen, a super fast New England baked beans. And you can get this recipe and all the recipes from this season, along with our tastings, testings, and select episodes on our website, americastestkitchen.com. Oh, so good. So okay. good. Getting mm. a little pepper in the back of your throat. I am getting a little pepper. Mm. Thanks for watching America's Test Kitchen. What'd you think? Well, leave a comment and let us know which recipes you're excited to make, or you can just say hello. You can find links to today's recipes and reviews in the video description. And don't forget to subscribe to our channel. See you later. I'll see you later. <laughs>